everyone. Wow, big turnout. Um, I'm Isabella Kaminska from the Financial Times. I blog for FT Alphaville, and I'm joined today uh, by John Chambers, who's chairman, executive chairman, excuse me, of Cisco Systems, and um, but but really here to talk to us about the future of digitization. Um, the topic, the title of our session is "Every Country Will Be Digital." Tell us a little bit about what you mean by that, perhaps. You know, when you think about the role technology has had on society, you had the first generation of the internet, which had a huge implication from 1990 to probably 2010. Uh, the digital world, I think, began to take off in 2010, and we're just now going Main Street. And what it really means is dramatic economic change, dramatic change to citizens' lives. It has the potential to impact everyone in the world where the internet era only had a small segment. What it means in technology terms, it's about combining cloud and security and mobility to get the right information at the right time to the right person or machine to make the right decision. Its economic benefit, next 10 years, probably $19 trillion. That's the U.S. economy plus some. It's 1% to 3% incremental GDP growth per country. But it's also what occurred in the first generation of the Internet where uh, President Clinton, even though he's from the other party that I'm from, grasped what it meant to America. And over his eight years in office, and we were on stage like this at the White House when he announced the Internet era with the president, he generated 22 and a half million jobs in the U.S., real median income increase of 24 percent, GDP growth of 36 percent in eight years. You're about to see the same thing occur on a global basis, starting with countries leading the way, small countries like Israel, Netanyahu, and the prior uh, Shimon Perez, who recently passed away, unfortunately. Uh, Alain in France. France is becoming the startup nation in Europe, surprised a lot of people. And Modi in India is bringing this to 1.3 billion people. So as we move from connecting 1,000 devices to the Internet, which is what existed when Cisco was founded 30 years ago, to 15 billion today, to 500 billion in 15 years, the power of a network is the number of devices squared. It will change every industry, every person's life, mainly for the better. So um, obviously this sounds ex ex absolutely extraordinary to someone who's not necessarily involved deeply in the digitization uh, mm -hmm. of everything. Can you maybe give us some more color about sure. what it really means for the av average everyday person? And I mean, when everything is digitized in your big sure. vision. I think one of the best ways to do it is to take a country uh, such as India with 1.3 billion people and talk about the aspiration that Prime Minister Modi understands that digital India can mean for his country. He believes that for the average person, their GDP of the country, instead of struggling to get 2 to 3 percent growth, could be 7 to 10 percent. And they're the fastest growing economy in the world. If you want to bet on a, a major country right now on GDP and economic future, bet on India. He's thinking about how he does this for 1.3 billion people. He's thinking about how does he make India the startup capital of Asia. He's thinking about what partnerships does he want to make that happen. He's wiring his nation with 10 to 15 megs to every home in the nation, targeted at $2.50 per month. He's saying, how do you do this in large states, perhaps in Andhra Pradesh at 50 million people, and how do you change everything from education to health care? Get your pallets going. How do you do security across the whole envelope? And how do you dramatically not create just a million jobs a year, but a million jobs incrementally per month, which is what India needs to prosper going forward? How they can double the per capita income in the next decade, which I think is a very reasonable goal to occur. How they will change their education system, both to retrain existing workers and others. So what Prime Minister Modi's done is he's encompassed this in a way his citizens get not by thinking about this in silos, but thinking about it in outcomes. Had the courage to dream what is possible and make it happen. We see all the same thing occur, interestingly enough, with the socialistic leader in France, where President Hollande in France outlined a vision for a digital France two years ago. And for France to have this benefit for all 66 million people, to talk about France becoming the startup nation in Europe, and by the way, for those of you who are not following the data, France in the first six months of this year, January, February, March, April, May, June, 
was the number one country in Europe in terms of venture capital investments in startups. So this is a period that it has a chance to disrupt everyone with many positives. You will live longer, your healthcare will be better, uh, your probabilities of getting raises are higher, but if companies or countries or cities don't move, they also risk getting left behind, which is the downside of how fast this is going to occur. So in terms of the people who are being left behind, obviously there is a concern out there at the moment that um, a lot of the radical political sort of response that we've seen both in the UK and in, in America yes. is down to this transition. Yes. Um, tell us a little bit about where you see these people, how they should be supported, and to what end um, government has to play a role in this. Now, Isabel, if it's all right, I will... I don't see these people being different than other people. Uh, when I look at it, my, I have a two-year-old granddaughter who's now a little bit older. And at two years of age, she had gotten her mother's iPhone. She had busted the security code on it. She was playing games on the, you know, on the iPhone and off to the races. And I look at my son and I said, Stanford early emissions. That was a joke, by the way. And, and when I said that, he said, Dad, every two-year-old knows how to do this. The point that I'm making with digitization if done right for healthcare or your jobs as a postman or your jobs as a doctor or as a nurse uh, is to use the power of the computer to make your lives enriched and to be able to combine this power of 500 billion devices in ways that will change the lives. Now what we have to do is rethink how we train workers and how we train our young people in school and we've got to do this dramatically fast because otherwise the concern you have will be valid. So if you watch, let's use France again as an example, uh, we're partnering with the government, strategic partnership between the government of France and Cisco, they've never done that with a business company ever, much less an American high-tech company, to transform the country together. We're re-educating 200,000 French men and women on what the Internet of Things is. When people take those courses with our network academies, uh, they 70% of them who are unemployed find a job within six months and it gives them the skills so they can participate in the future. They also have the courage to say, let's redo education, especially for our young people. Capture the imagination of the eight to 10 year old, regardless of uh, diversity, whether you're a male or a female or your religion, and say, how do you really train the skills early on for what entrepreneurism is in business? And again, I repeat, this was by a socialistic government. And then you have in Israel, that thinks about with 7.5 million people, how do you do this inclusive of all their religions? Uh, how do you get a very active participate by the Arab population, which is two million of the seven and a half million? How do you get the Orthodox Jewish population back really heavily involved? How do you look at an Eastern Negev where I was just a month and a half ago, the poorest section within Israel with the largest diversity of religions and backgrounds to participate in this society for the future. So I think you've got to retrain the workforce. You've got to train, change the chance of education. And much like my two-year-old granddaughter who's now considerably older, if you give technology skills to people and really give them a chance to participate, most of them will cross that chasm. We just have to give people a little bit of help. Um, and in terms of the help, I mean, today is obviously a very important day. Um, I was wondering uh, if you could share with us which candidate in the U.S. election is more likely to be pro-digitization and supportive of that. <laughs> um, I'm a, a moderate Republican, which in the U.S. is an endangered species. Um, I support both Democrats and Republicans on many issues. I'm more interested in where they are in technology. Uh, this will be the first time in my lifetime I'm voting for a Democrat. And I'm going to vote for Hillary Clinton. I've already voted. And um, I'm doing it because I think she better than anyone else that's running for president. We're the only country in the world, the U.S. is the only country in the world that does not have a digitization plan. Abi in Japan does, Modi in India, Merkel in Germany. And there is no entitlement in this new world. And so while the internet race was led by the U.S. and President Clinton, uh, her husband, did this in the 90s, I think Hillary has the best chance of really getting America back on track. We haven't had a pay raise in America that stuck for 15 years. 
Uh, and that's why you see America angry. Uh, we need a leader who's going to reunite us. I think our election has been brutal, and I think all of us understand the negatives that go with that. I hope that the new leader, whoever they are, and I hope that it will be Hillary, uh, will bring our country back to participation by all groups and talk about how technology won't enable just 10% of our population, but all of our population. We'll see if that happens or not. So um, you also mentioned to me backstage that Cisco supports um, the whole sort of transition in terms of offering uh, education services for people to learn yes. new skills. Will you be offering Hillary some, uh, some free education on how to manage her email <laughs> skills? Sorry, <laughs> had to ask. <laughs> now, in no, case you missed the question, one of the things you do as a speaker is when you get a question that you're clearly not going to answer, you distract the audience and you focus on where you're going to go. So your question about security is a very good one. And so when you think about 500 billion devices connected to the internet, and you think about the problem can come from any one of those devices, anyone's email, anyone's server, any sensor, then you're gonna to have to have a security architecture that goes across it. And so as you think about all the positives that can occur here, uh, if you don't have security done in a entirely encompassing way, the bad guys will always be a step ahead of you. Everyone in this room knows there's more money, unfortunately, on cyber crime than there is in traditional crime. And what this market, I think, requires is an architectural approach to security, much like an intelligent self-learning network that can defend against day zero attacks, that can defend when people make operational mistakes, and all people make mistakes at times, and then your ability to really take advantage when everything you do in life your car will be self-driving, your electricity will be delivered over the internet, your health, your you will probably live 10 years longer, cancer will probably be eradicated in the next 10 to 20 years for most basic types of cancer. Your job, if we do it right, will be subject to pay increases as opposed to pay decreases, but it requires a plan to get there. The same thing is true of security. Security has to encompass the whole approach to the market and say, how do we, uh, we think about this as a security first? Because nation states will fight wars by bringing down infrastructure. What you saw in the Ukraine with the electrical grid coming down can happen to any country in Europe or to the US or to Asia Pacific. So security is a must for digitization to work well. I mean, certainly I would was say... Was that transition okay? Yeah, no, it was very good because okay. I was going to ask you about security and the Internet <laughs> of Things. And I think the recent hack um, proves that people are perhaps um, concerned about how this world of multiple connected devices will handle uh, their personal privacy and their security. Um, but I also wanted to ask you, you mentioned backstage that like two years ago when you were talking about mass digitization, uh, you would go to major corporations and they would laugh at you. And yeah. that's changed in the last two years. Yeah. Why do you think that's happened in the last two years? What's different? Sure. So is all of us, how many of us in this room would describe yourself as a technologist? As we all know, when a new change starts to occur, we get excited a little bit early. We see it so plainly what's going to happen. And we, at times, don't understand why people don't embrace it quicker. And that's the way technology has always occurred. But as you lead up to this, then you hit an inflection point. And at that inflection point is when things go, using Jeffrey Moore's example, crossing the chasm to Main Street or Mainline. The inflection point for digitization occurred last year. Uh, 2015, we'll look back and say it was the inflection point when the world changed. Prior to that, when I talked to CEOs and I had the honor to talk to the large automotive companies of Ford or GM to their board of directors and their management team three years ago. And I would share with them that 40 to 50% of the major enterprise companies in the world would not exist in a meaningful way in 10 years. And that their competition would be a new generation of startups, not necessarily building cars, but different business models like Uber, uh, different collection of data like Google or Apple or Microsoft does and that they would have to change their business models, their innovation process, et cetera. And if they didn't, they'd get left behind. The audience was kind of lukewarm. Having talked to both boards of directors, their top leadership team, Market Ford, Marriott GM CEOs, they get this as the transition for innovation. They have to make the changes. In 
last Friday, I talked to 100 of the top CEOs in the world at the Global 100 in New York City. And after we had a discussion similar to what we just said about digitization, how the companies would have to change, how it was both about technology, but more important, how did they change organization structure and culture and innovation at a faster speed, I asked how many of you would agree with that. 95% of the room raised their hand. So what you're seeing is this has gone mainstream. You have leaders, as I mentioned before, about a Modi or a Lan or a Netanyahu, who are, who are the examples, and now you see others following. But that doesn't mean that the big companies win. The most likely companies that win will be startups. Almost all the job creation, in fact, all the job creation over the next decade will be from small companies or startups getting bigger. And that's why my other passion is how do you enable a new generation of startups? How do you get a startup culture that used to be primarily an American philosophy and primarily a West Coast American philosophy that now you see it in Berlin, you see it in Paris, you see it in Songdo, uh, you see it in Lisbon in a different way. And so startups are where the job creation will be. But these new startups, every company will be digital. Every country, every city will be digital as well. So I would have asked you how you square that ex like startup scene with exponential growth and a winner-takes-all um, sort of dynamic in technology, but um, we don't have time. So I, instead, I will now ask you very quickly, to what end is all this digitization? What is, if, if, if you could just tell me, what is, a, what is you know, let's project forwards. Where, if everything plays out as you envision, what would you like to see? To what end is all this? Sure. I believe the opportunities far outweigh the challenges. I think the model that we saw with the internet era that went for two decades produced benefits to about maybe 15% of the world society and businesses in a big way. This time, I think we have a chance, if we do it right, for it to be much more inclusive and global. The opportunity is for every person in the world, and this is why India is so important with 1.3 billion people, what Modi is doing there to be an example, that if you can dramatically increase the standard of living, that this can be inclusive not just of the rich regions or the well-educated, but of all people in the country. That you have leaders who get this at a government, at a city, at a business level, that will transform, but also get you either disrupt or you're gonna get disrupted, which means they've gotta change rapidly. The key reasons countries or companies or individuals will not be successful is they fail to get this transition right. They make the mistake of doing the right thing too long. They fail to reinvent themselves. They think there's an entitlement that just because you were a big company or a successful city or nation before means you'll lead in this next decade. They fall into the trap of trying to stay doing business in silos as opposed to breaking those down and focus on outcomes for their citizens or for their customers. But I believe the transition will occur, Sabella. I think that it will be one that we'll look back 10 years from now, maybe on a stage like this, and we'll watch how many of our predictions will or will not come true. If it's compared to the internet 15 years before, uh, with President Clinton on stage in the White House, everything that we outlined did happen and even more, and I think that's the opportunity in front of us. I think for the people in this room to lead on this, to do it, as you said, in an inclusive way where you benefit the majority of the world, and to change is a chance of a lifetime. So I'm honored to be here at the Web Summit. It's exciting what's in front of us, and hopefully you didn't agree with everything I said, but if you walked away with one thing you're gonna be doing differently, then I've accomplished my goal today, and I wanna thank you for the exchange. Thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you.